We have two Hall of Famers in the room here this morning, along with uh, head coach John Lowry, who, a Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't even, I've lost track of how many different Hall of Fames you're a member of now. John, welcome back to the program. Great to have you, sir. Come on closer well, to your mic so we can hear you. Thank you. I appreciate you asking me to be here. You picked up round number, win number 1,400 last week in Myrtle Beach. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Um, like I told somebody else, that just shows you. Been around a long time, I guess, you know. You get, uh, but I've been fortunate over the years, uh, being a good spot, being the right spot at the right time, and being a good area. I think you guys know the how high school baseball is valued in our area, not only in the, our immediate area, but you can extend the panhandle out a little bit. It's a, you know, it's a, it's it's a, it's a hotbed for high school baseball, and I think you know, and being in the state of West Virginia with the number of games that you're allowed to play, you know, all that factors into it, and it's just, uh, it's been. Very enjoyable, and I still enjoy it. How was Myrtle Beach last week? It was great. You know, I think it was a little warmer up here than it was down there. Right. But uh, you know, to me, it was ideal down there. You know, upper 60s, low 70s. Um, had some rain on Friday and didn't get to play, but we got four games in, and uh, you know, it was, it was a good experience. It's not only you know an opportunity to play teams from other areas and see some uh, you know other states and so forth, but it's. It's a chance for your team to bond. You know, we had a picnic one night at the Ocean Lake res, uh, Resort there where our, our team uh, and their family stay and right along the ocean. And you can see the guys out there playing flag football on the beach and doing things together and uh, had the golf carts that they can kind of go around on. You know, I, I, it's a fun time for them, not only a baseball time, but it's a, it's a fun time. And, and we've been doing it to the point now where – a lot of our families will plan that week off, and you know it becomes a vacation type of thing for them. So it's a, um, it's it's a great week. We enjoy it. So if, if football teams go away, do they play baseball on the beach? Coach, does it work that way in opposite? Maybe, maybe wiffle ball. Wiffle ball. <laughs> hey, who wouldn't play in a wiffle ball tournament? Is that yeah. the most fun thing ever, There's right? There's nothing more fun than trying to get that wiffle ball to move. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'll tell you, you know, wiffle ball growing up, I think really uh, for the guys who did it, when the weight of ball would break, I think that mm-hmm. helped you with your hitting and hitting and breaking stuff and yeah. all speed yeah. stuff. But I think it ruined some arms throwing those. <laughs> ball, but I, think it I, I played a heck of a lot of wiffle ball, coach, and I still couldn't hit. You know, normally well, you have a big strike zone there, John. That's yeah, a lot I to do. Cover. It's discrimination. It's one more, one more case of height discrimination. It works against you as a baseball player, I think, to be six seven. Yeah, it really right? does. Yeah, it's great at parades, though. Yeah, Macy's. I'm there. Good, you always have a good view. Yes. All right, Matt Miller. Coach, take us back to the very beginning and what kind of led you into a coaching career? What was it about the sport and, and wanting to be a baseball coach? Well, you know, I've always enjoyed sports. In high school, I, I, you know, I was involved in all the sports and I went to college at Potomac State. I, um, initially, I played you know, basketball and, and uh, baseball. Uh, then I had a year at the academy, Naval Academy, where I got to play baseball and got to cross paths with some pretty neat guy, you know, Roger Staubach being one of them. He was the captain of the baseball team down there. He wasn't captain of the football team. Uh, but we with two different teams. They didn't play on the same team with him, but we, everybody shared the same dressing room. So that was neat. And, you know, the kind of guy he is, so affable. He wasn't into that military hierarchy type stuff. He, he was just a great guy. Not saying the other guys weren't great guys, but he, you know, with his uh, – uh, his nature has been. And then uh, after it didn't work out down there for me, I came back to the Fairmont State where I had the opportunity to be involved with, with their baseball program. And, and, and in 1968, the team I played on up there, I, I didn't get to play much up there, really. I played behind a guy named Jim Mertens, who was from uh, Fort Hill, who ended up in the NFL I played tight end a couple of years, but he was also drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. And we had three other guys besides Jim that were drafted from that team, four four draft choices off that, you know, WVIAC team. So we had a pretty good club. And, uh, you know, that was the year that Fairmont won the national championship in football. They were runner-up in basketball, lost by three points, and we came within one game of going to the national tournament in baseball. So, you know, they had some athletes on that campus at the time, and it it was always fun to be around those guys. And then, of course, Joe Rutten, that's probably a name that rings a bell with a lot of people. He he was the icon up there at basketball. And, I, you know, I'd take all those coaching classes and so forth. And, and it's just something I always wanted to stay involved in, uh, coaching. And uh, 
when I got out and I came back and had the opportunity to start, I started out as a driver ed teacher, spending the mornings at Shepherdstown, the afternoons at Harpers Ferry, and I was an assistant football coach at Harpers Ferry, and head track coach the first year, if you believe that. I didn't, I didn't know you could. I knew you coached football, but I didn't know you could in basketball. Well, I a lot about the track stories. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I got into junior high basketball down there, and that started the ball. But the uh, the track thing, I, 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 I had two guys come out for the track team. But since I was coaching junior high basketball, I had some pretty good, you know, little athletes there in the seventh, eighth grade. So we kind of switched it and said, well, we'll get some junior high meets for these guys and kind of built. And then after that year, um, Coach Rizzo, who was also the basketball coach there at the time, uh, had been the baseball coach, stepped away from baseball, and that gave me the opportunity to get involved with the baseball program down there. So uh, that was 1971, and of course the two years there, then the schools. Uh, consolidated and then you know it's, here you uh, are been there mr bogwell so you mentioned joe retton some some of our listeners may not know the significance of joe retton of course his daughter mary lou retton one of the greatest uh greatest gymnasts in american history probably in in all of olympic history um yeah. i just that might, that's kind of neat i mean it's sort of a sort of a neat pathway can you tell us a little bit about about what kind of person he was that would have driven her to do those things well actually you know the retton family up there was kind of a um I, for lack of a better way of saying it the iconic iconic name up there actually mary lou was ronnie retton's daughter oh. ronnie retton was the one who played in the backcourt with the mountaineers when jerry west was there mm-hmm. and uh Coach Retton had gone. He, he was a uncle, or it, it was a you know family right. family situation, and um, Coach Retton had coached at Barracksville High School there. I was looking on through something the other uh, yesterday. I think it was. I saw where one year he had they they listed all the the basketball teams that had won state championships that were undefeated. He was twenty seven and zero one year at Barracksville, and then he went to Fairmont. And one time he was the uh, he had the highest winning percentage of any division uh, coach, you know, uh, it, when he was coaching basketball. For him. He was also the assistant baseball coach, too. Have you ever thought about getting together with a few people who've coached a long period of time in West Virginia and putting together a book, writing a book about the history of high school sports in West Virginia? Because you have just this encyclopedic knowledge of of everything i mean through different sports through west virginia history i mean it would be great to get it on paper well you know doug huff y'all familiar with mm-hmm. doug huff? He, you know, really? he, he kind of chronicles a lot of that stuff from the record standpoint you know of who holds records in different categories of things in the different nations of sports it it you know it, it would be interesting you know i've had the opportunity to know a lot of guys who uh at the high school level and I want to, and I'll be remiss if I didn't mention two others from the collegiate level that really were influential uh, to me. And one was Coach Bob Starkey from down here at Shepherd, mm-hmm. and the other was Cal Bailey from West Virginia yeah. State, the baseball coach there. And, and Coach Starkey was always such a, a great guy. He, he, I remember when I got the basketball job at uh, Jefferson, he called and said that he was teaching a, a class on on uh, coaching basketball in the summertime. If I just wanted to sit in on it and audit, I'd be more than well. I mean, he reached out and did that. He didn't have to do that. But then he was, he was just, uh, uh, just what a great guy. And of course, Cal Bailey at West mm-hmm. Virginia State, he, um, both gentlemen have passed down, but their legacy mm-hmm. and their memory live on. Starkey was one of my favorite people. His, it would be his second stint when he came back, because at that point he didn't care anymore. No. <laughs> if he didn't like you, he told you. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 no question. He was up front. I mean, if he, uh, I could tell you some stories there. But probably, probably not meant for the air, but uh, he, he, what a great guy. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned something, Coach, at the beginning about maximum, the amount of games. Our, team, our baseball teams in West Virginia, are we really hamstrung? by the amount of games we can play compared to what other states are allowed to play? We're not hamstrung. No. I, I think, you know, we get, okay. to play, we get to play 32 games. And, he, and before 1984, uh, we were allowed to play as many games as, as you wanted. Then they changed it in 84 to 30 games plus a tournament. Well, some of the teams down in the Kanawha Valley, they'd run a 
season long tournament on weekends, <laughs> making, making it round robin so that they could, you know, get, so then they changed it to where you can play 32 games, and that includes any tournament that you might want to be involved in. If you, you know, 32 games, that's mm. a one year we played 45 games. Yeah. But, wow. uh, uh, Wahama, if you look back, talked about the history and some of the, some of those teams out there played, uh, uh, up in the 50s, you know. Dave Caesar at New Mountainsville or New Martinsville. Yeah. He used to play a lot of games. They said he'd play double hitters in the morning. Talk about iconic hitters. names. Caesar's yeah. an iconic name in that area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. you got to have a lot of pitchers to do that. Yeah. So what is the fine line? Because we hear it a lot in the game of baseball that you, you just got to get out and play and play and play and play. But at the same time, I'm sure as a coach, you're going, we need a day off where we can get on the field and work on certain things. So where's the fine line in being able to play a 32-game schedule schedule but still get in some practice time and even some downtime well it's a game of repetition there's mm -hmm. no question about that i mean um and that's you, that's the point you have to make to the kids and some guys it takes a while maybe to, to figure that out we're fortunate that we have two fields you know a lot of schools with the one field they'll play a jv game before and then the varsity game and then with the, the time period between the two doesn't allow for batting practice and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Well, if we play a 6 o'clock game, you know, we're on the field starting our BP and things at 4 o'clock. So that's where we get our practice time in, you know, during in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and then an example of getting them time off, you know, we played last week, traveled home on uh, Saturday. Uh, we play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, with Wednesday's game being at Hampshire, and then we leave Friday morning to go to Greenbrier. So we won't practice on Thursday to give them the day off to try to recoup a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you're right, they need uh, – there's a um, – but, you know, they got to get their reps in. they got to feel the ball. they got to make their throws. Mm -hmm. but the pitchers got to get their bullpens. The guys got to get in the cage and work on uh, their timing. And uh, – I, that's a, I always tell our guys this story, and um, maybe some people think it might be a little much for high school kids, but I'll say, you know, when I was in the Valley League, when if we had a player that was pretty good and a scout would come up, he'd say, can he play every day? And, I, you know, you got to be able to play every day in this game because, you know, you're not going to feel – uh, the top of the line every day so you got to mm -hmm. be able to fight through some of those uh, days maybe when you don't feel yeah. quite as good as you do other days going back to the retins jeff haddix one of our listeners uh who i met by the way at the uh, home show uh jeff thanks for stopping by i said i took golf and coaching classes from joe retin at fsc yeah. that's pretty cool nice. right well you know i said he was the assistant baseball coach and the truth was he liked baseball better than basketball uh -huh. and uh he he loved baseball and he loved the pirates and he he, he my was man uh, he, <laughs> we're 10 and 7 baby what, what time is uh what time is the game when can you be here the Love pirates that. 10 and 7 hey we're doing better now you can't bob, talk oh, yeah. bad about us bob now. prince we had him all the way right the gunner <laughs> yeah i got the thrill of my life was getting to meet him when i was at, over at kdka back in the 80s man grew up listening to on the radio let me ask a question about little league and travel ball i've got one of my good friends has a son playing little league out in hedgesville and there's also a lot of travel ball going on with other sports you don't see the travel ball going on during the exact same season as the the accepted season for little league soccer does though he's got he said a lot of the the guys who are little league coaches are also coaching they're also coaching travel teams so the, maybe the little league kids aren't getting as much attention. And this weekend, I was talking to him. He said, "He said I don't think we're going to win this weekend." I said, "Well, you, you said your son's team six and zero. They're great." He said, "Yeah, but three of our guys are playing in a travel tournament, so they won't be here for little league." What's your feeling about that? I mean, isn't there enough time after little league ends for the travel season? Like, like it works with basketball. Basketball, you have your school ball and everything, and, and all the local stuff during the year. And then the kids, as soon as those seasons are over, the kids start playing travel. But with baseball, it's going the whole little league season and then all the way through the fall. Do you do you have thoughts about that? Well, I have thoughts. I you know I, th I think the travel ball. The, 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 the idea is, I guess, to get the guys out and um, get the exposure and and whatnot. But you know, they go out and the pitchers will pitch an inning or two, or they they would come back and they say, "I'm a I'm a PO," which means they're a pitcher only. Uh, you know, the, the, the arm strength, I guess, is a premium. Everybody wants to see how hard somebody can throw the ball. Let's see if they can pitch. You know, let's see if they can, can move the ball around a little bit, change speeds, and uh, uh, command a strike zone. Uh, I, I just, 
from a personal standpoint, I, you know, the, I think if you're involved in a good program locally, you, you're going to save a lot of money. Uh, people won't agree with me on this, and that, that's fine. That's, uh, uh, but if you're good enough, you're going to get seen. And uh, I think the money that some of these guys play for these travel teams, that's pretty significant when you start to add it up. And, and I, I, I think the memories are built with playing with guys that you grew up with, guys that you knew. And, uh, you know, and we've had plenty of guys before the, the advent of travel ball that went on and have done well. Uh, I mean, look locally with. Creek, what he got to big leagues. He didn't play travel ball. Scotty Bullet didn't play travel ball. Uh, you know, you can look at the guys at uh, uh, for our program that got to play collegiately before the, the advent of travel ball. So if you're good enough, you're going to get seen. Uh, I guess another factor that's probably it allows the college coaches maybe to be present because our games are during their season. So you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it uh, and I'm not so sure that the money factor being made on the other end it's not bingo <laughs> well I mean I, I'm in turn travel travel sports yeah. for every sport turns a fun youth sport into a almost for-profit enterprise because they build complexes mm-hmm. oh, for yeah. tourism build it they will come to bring club yeah. to bring these club teams in for tournaments I mean, people think about Disney World as the rides and whatever. You go out to Disney World for volleyball tournaments, mm-hmm. baseball tournaments, basketball tournaments. There's, there's every form of tournament that you take these club yeah. teams to now. I mean, I, I like the travel sports. I mean, I had a son who played travel lacrosse for years. My daughter played travel basketball. I just don't think it should be during the same season as your your local, you know, Little League or whatever. Um, I mean, I think I think the, the camaraderie, the travel, the experiences. I mean, I think it's good for the kids. I just don't know that when you've got eight to ten year olds playing little league, playing travel. I mean, I don't know if that that breaks their bodies down at some point. Will it, will it burn them out? You know, I don't know. I mm-hmm. I, uh, I guess baseball would almost have to, to approach it that way. I guess you'd have the fall that you could you could work in, but you know, the weather factor I think mm-hmm. controls baseball. Big a lot. issue. And, yeah. It's the one they can. Matt Miller. Well, what is it about coaching that that keeps you there? Uh, you know, as as you, I mean, you've retired from teaching many years ago, but you've said, you know, I want to continue to coach, and and you're, you're continuing to obviously coach at a very high level. What is it about the game, about the kids, about your assistant coaches that each year as you finish a season, uh, I'm sure you have to think about next year and you know when that time may come to to retire. But but you're going, I'm having too much fun. Why? What is it? Well, you know, I'm, I, I like I have a good group of people to work with we have a good uh, good program we you know not only from the on the field coaches that help us but to support people with our boosters and the things that they do to, to help us with the uh, you know with the details so forth when you travel and all that and, you know I, I, I love watching the kids develop I love watching uh, uh, seeing them pull together uh, uh, to feel good about themselves when they uh, accomplish something uh, I'd be less than forthright if I didn't say I, I enjoyed the competition from a personal standpoint. Uh, I, 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 I enjoy being out there on the field, really, at this time of the year. It just makes you feel good to be out in the um, open air. But it, the, the fact that I've been able to do it as long it reflects the fact that I've had a lot of good people around me to help me, especially with the physical things that they're – Coaching baseball entails, you know, the, the field prep and all those kind of things. Uh, uh, we have people to help us with our fundraising. You know, and, uh, I've got several guys that have played for us that have, uh, you know, now are assistant coaches. Some of them on the volunteer level. I've had uh, uh, coaches that have uh, been with me for a number of just for a number of years, and it, you know, it kind of get, get, gets the. Uh, uh, a feeling of, of of closeness there that you that you enjoy and and obviously you know I mean I I, I retired from teaching when I was uh, fifty nine and a half so I mean I still needed to have something to do so I wanted to <laughs> keep keep in you know and not only do you coach in the spring but there's you know you got clinics 
you can go to during the and uh, during the, uh, the off season. Um, you know, you build your schedule. You know, just a lot of little things that don't require not not the things that you have to do, but things that you want to do. And I think yeah. that's uh, that's the key to. Uh, anything you might want to do in life is doing what you want to do as yeah. opposed to what maybe you would have to do. Does a coach miss something by not being in the building during the day, John? I, I'm starting to see that a little bit because, you know, I'm coaching guys now that weren't even born when I was teaching. So, uh, but uh, I, I've, I've had some people, you know, within the building that help me with the pulse of what's going on. Uh, uh, I'll stop by from time to time. Uh, you know, my son John teaches out there. Uh, he's he's never been on our staff, but still, he you know he has a feel for what's going on. We have a, a Jacob Whitmore yeah. uh, played at Fairmont, and he graduated from Muslim. He teaches out there now. He's on our staff, and uh, he interacts with the kids. And if there's a kid that I, maybe I want to get a message to, or a kid that maybe we will have a concern about, you know, he's kind of an intermediary for us in yeah. that regard. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I do. But you know, if you if you look around now, and in, in a lot of situations, um, coaches aren't in buildings with the guys and it, you know they're guys from the outside more so than when i played when, mm -hmm. when you were when i was in high school i think you had to be a teacher to right. be to be a coach and yeah. i think the fact that it became hard to get coaches in that's when they started allowing guys to take the coaching class and you know were you the guy they sent your baseball players to when there was a behavior issue as opposed to the principal well you know i've had and that and that used to that used to bother me a little bit too. They they'd say, Coach, one of your players did this and did that, you know. And my thought on that was, you know, they don't. I don't have any trouble with them. Come on, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I'll talk to them fine. But if if they got to be able to take care of their own problems, right? I mm -hmm. mean, if if a kid's not acting particularly the way he's supposed to in a classroom, yeah, I can tell him what he needs to do. But I don't think I'm the ultimate uh, authoritarian in that regard. I think it's mm -hmm. up to the teacher that has that kid in the classroom to be able to coach let me ask you a competition question quickly you've got 1400 wins you said you're second or third all time are the people ahead of you are they still coaching are they retired or are they still still garnering i wins? think there's one guy and i Iowa seems to be a state that must get to play a lot of games because yeah. they're look some of the guys that are up there you the dreams uh, man yeah I, I read the other day where there's a guy in new york that has over 2,200 wins, but his includes fall wins and spring wins. I think from a spring win thing, the guy in Iowa has like 1,420 some. And I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still coaching or Do not. Do we need to go have a talk with him? No. <laughs> I, think there's one guy, I think there's one guy who's retired out there. It's got like 1,567 uh, or something like that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your schedule like this week, John, on the Diamond? Well, you know, last night we were up at Berkeley Springs. Tonight we go to Hedgesville. Hedgesville's one of the teams that beat us early in the year, and they have a nice club. They got some guys with some good arms, and they uh, uh, so you know we're with that. And then tomorrow night we go to Hampshire. Of course, you know that's a, uh, a trip that we'll get back from late. And then uh, Thursday, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to give them the day off. And then uh, Friday evening we play uh, Greenbrier East. And then we play Spring Valley who was ranked number one in the state preseason. I think they're number three now. Play them at uh, down in Lewisburg. And we'll also play Greenbrier East again. Then we come home next week. And we got, uh, let's see if I can remember. We go to Frankfurt on Monday. And we got Musselman on Tuesday. We got Washington on Wednesday. <laughs> wow. And uh, but so we play, we're playing every day here. It's, yeah. uh, you know, and they talk about, you know, the pitching and so forth. Uh, you know, if you play, you got to have pitchers. Yeah. That's the way guys develop. You get out there and see what they can do. Is right. this a time coming back from Myrtle Beach that you, you want to kind of be hitting your stride, so to speak? You know, hopefully the bats get hot when you're down there and and now you you kind of hit the ground running to close out the season? Well, you know, actually we're, we, we've are we played 15 games. So we still have 17 okay. to go. Yeah. Even though the tournament's going to start, I think, May, the week of May 9th. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hopefully we can start getting some rhythm right. in our approaches at the plate and we can eliminate the frustration when things don't go mm -hmm. you know yeah this this is a 
you know, you got to. This is a game where you can't look backwards. Right. Jeff Reynolds. I don't know if anybody remembers that name or not. Jeff mm-hmm. played for us in the late seventies, and he got to Triple A. And and when he was had been away for a year, I said, Jeff, what'd you learn in pro ball this year? He said, Coach. He said, When you go zero for four today, you forget about it and get ready to play tomorrow. Well, mm-hmm. high school kids sometimes they they can't they carry those things along with mm-hmm. them, and uh, I think it's inherent with the age a little bit. You know, everybody likes to make everybody. Uh, feel comfortable, but the reality is that everybody's not always going to be comfortable, mm-hmm. and uh, everybody doesn't always need to hear the things that they want to hear, but they need mm-hmm. to hear the things that they need to hear, and that sometimes creates some uh, a challenge. That's what the challenge of what we do as coaches. We're, we're not as breakable as some people think we are, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, John, great to visit with you again. Yes. Well, I appreciate, again, you having me on. Congratulations on another round number, sir. Well, thank you. Although I don't have a round belt. <laughs> I'm losing weight, so I'm proud of you. Hey, good for you. Good Nothing for you. Nothing wrong with that.